getting to know you. Babe. Got it. Hey, super. Awesome. Twin Cities. All right. From community. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I think we'll just kick it off with explaining with what our community is about, and then we'll uh, hand it off to you and Vlad. How about that? Um, so we started the Twin Cities last uh, Jerry and, and Sam and I started this back in um, September of 2020. And we get together every uh, second Tuesday of every month. Um, every other one is a lean coffee. So we have kind of like smaller group discussions about uh, people in the community. And it's not just Twin Cities, it's it, it, we've grown, uh, we welcome people from all over the world, but we're here to talk about, uh, you know, large scale scrum. What is large scale scrum? It's it's more of a descaling framework it's based on scrum as it's defined by Ken Schwaber and Jeff, Jeff Sutherland. Um, but a lot of uh, the companies that we work at are, are actually kind of at this uh, scale that they don't really need to be, and it really gets in the way of delivering value. So we thought it'd be great to have Joe on here because he's talking about flat organizations, and um, that's kind of in the same vein as this. So we're really excited about that. Um, what is less though? It's it's an organizational design framework um, based on having a single product backlog, um, a single definition of done across all teams potentially shippable increment each sprint, uh, one product owner, not several product owners, um, and uh, cross-functional teams uh, completing the work. And um, we've been uh, growing and growing, and we have a, a, next month we'll have a Lean Coffee, so please do join us if you like the smaller group discussions. So thank you. I'll pass it off to you, uh, Vlad, to... And yeah, if you would uh, let me share my screen for a second, please uh, uh, allow me that, David. Uh, uh, give me permission and security David, just for a second. Wonderful to hear what he's about and how to get involved with it. Thank you. And David, the wall behind you looks so credentialed. I'm pretty <laughs> sure you put a new crown in my teeth and like but qualified to do anything. Represent me in a massive real estate deal. I, I can do it all. You know, I'm an astronaut. Um, I'm a lawyer. I mean, there's it's, the credentials are endless. So, uh, Vlad, I'm trying to make you I'm trying to make you. It's not letting me. It'll come. Place pin. So, Vlad, you're not able to share screen. Can Vlad be a co-host? Maybe. Yeah, I'm trying to right click or click more and up looks like a stream, screen's coming up. Okay. Oh, nice some of those pictures. <laughs> wow. Vlad, is this your screen? I think you're right to rock. Vlad, I don't hear you. You're on mute, buddy. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I would, I would, I would like to introduce Joe Justice today. I, I will challenge myself because there is so much to say. Uh, Joe Justice works uh, globally as an interim agile executive with well-known multinational organizations and bringing them to the next level of agility and innovation. Uh, Joe has worked with Bill Gates and leadership team of, team of Amazon, executive level uh, of Bosch. Uh, worked with Toyota company, top-down training Scrum, all their executives, and operated Agile at Tesla from the co company headquarters, working uh, with and alongside Elon Musk. Uh, Joe is the author of the book Scrum Master, translated to seven languages, a TEDx speaker, guest lecturer at both MIT and Oxford University in England, and spoken <clears> on behalf of Google, Microsoft, Lockheed Martin, HP Labs, and others. Joe, uh, Joe's work has been featured in Forbes, Harvard Business Review, and CNN Money. Creator of Extreme Manufacturing, Joe founded Wikispeed, which became, uh, became an example of automotive uh, design and production speed. Joe, Joe's team have uh, held three world records, designed and built 14 race and road legal cars, and some designed and built and as quickly as in 27 minutes excited to hear about this. And uh, Joe uh, was featured in Forbes uh, five times today, including as an owner of a company to watch by uh, Forbes Billionaire Club, cited in more than five business paperbacks and hard uh, covers, the subject of a Discovery Channel mini documentary 
but Joe's were creating discipline Scrum in hardware while working directly with uh, the co-creator of uh, Scrum, Dr. Jeff Sutherland and certified Scrum trainer personally endorsed by Jeff Sutherland, uh, board member of Micra Automated Vehicles, Aeronautical University, Boston University Agile Innovation Lab and chair of board of directors of the Agile Business Institute. Joe is also author of books which explain Agile to the people as young as two years old. It sounds like another world record. We have an honor to speak today to Joe Justice and very excited to ask our questions. Thank you for your generosity and care, Joe. Vladimir, when you say it, there's a lot. My mind is totally different. That was super kind. You, you did. You made my heart warm. That was super kind. <laughs> the shortest is I was a scrum master for Bill Gates and I learned a huge amount. Um, Bill's secret sauce, as far as I could learn, is Bill views everything, software, hardware, business deals, as parallel threads. So if there's one business deal or one financial service or one piece of software like Office, it's how many parallel executable cuts can we make? And then Bill invests big, Bill goes big. That was Bill's strategy at work. Bill at some points was the wealthiest person on planet earth. Bill will fund all of them at once. So there's not one office team for Microsoft, right? There's hundreds. And the reason there is, is Bill and then all Bill's successors, but Bill set this up, is views it as many parallel executing pieces and structured the company to have few wait states. So there's not like the quality assurance department at Microsoft, then everybody would be waiting on quality assurance. Instead, each of these groups has their own. So I learned that working for Bill. Then I did consult to leadership team at Amazon and Bezos kept all the team sizes small to maximize innovation. Later, I learned about number of communication pathways counts and how after six people, you have a dramatic swing up in complexity of communication and complexity theory and the math behind it. Later, I learned that later. Bezos insisted as a policy, simply keep teams less than six people so that they can innovate. And you get all these awesome soft skills, like when you have six people or less, like here's why I might be right, but here's why I might be wrong because you have time for that, right? Where if you have a team of 15 people, you can only say nothing and listen, or we should do X and like stake your reputation on it. You know, you don't have time to explore carefully and in a nuanced human way. And Bezos got that. So that was my primary takeaway from all of the leadership group at Amazon. And then Tesla rebooted my mind. Uh, in some ways broke my mind. I had already been an agilist for 15 years. Um, I was in Seattle when the book Lean Startup was written, and I would have lean coffees with the author, Eric Rees, every week. Um, also with Blake Lindsay, who did not become publicly famous, but is one of the most talented developers I've ever met, was heavily involved in those conversations. And so was Jim Benson. This is when the lean coffee format was created. Uh, so you have this hotbed of activity. A lot of agilists, like the video of the Nordstrom Innovation Lab, communicating what Kanban is. Now, interestingly, that video could also almost as easily be any Agile framework. It's just really good collaboration and fast, fast execution. But the original title was how Kanban works at the Nordstrom Innovation Lab. All of those participants were there in these first lean coffees. So Jeremy Lightsmith was there. Um, a, every member of the Nordstrom Innovation Lab team, that's when that video was filmed, or actually just after they filmed the video. The film, we were meeting before that. And that's when the book Scrum Bond was written by Corey Lattice, who was in those events. So we had this hotbed of communication and I was a part of it and I was doing hardware. I was the, the crazy one building cars, right? Everybody else was business process in general. And I was like, well, how do we build stuff with this? <laughs> I thought I knew Agile really well. And then I went to Tesla and I even operated the Agile program at Tesla. So if there's anyone qualified to talk about Agile at Tesla, it'd be Elon Musk, or if it's Agile, it'd be me. And it rebooted my mind. There is some things I brought to the table. I, I wasn't completely useless, but wow, I did a lot more learning than I did 
pushing out. And I would love to share that the best I can through the questions that I hope come. And I think Vlad has prepared a whole bunch. Um, but also here's, uh, please bear in mind, I am still processing this. Uh, so some of these questions I'm sure will make me sit back, reflect, close my eyes for a slow count of 10 as I try to figure it out because some things fit my agile vocabulary. A lot was novel and I'm still trying to digest it. And, and I think if anyone ever digests it, it will be whatever the next agile is. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm so excited to see you again after a mind blowing workshop that I took in December. And even after seven years of practicing Scrum at scale and working with 15 teams organizing the group more than 100 people, it was absolutely transformational. And, and together with your amazing book, with so many practical advice of how to get there. So it, it was amazing, it was amazing. And uh, uh, thank you so much. I would like to open uh, the uh, Slido um, here so you can actually scan the QR code, everybody, and then type in your questions. And also I put here the rules of engagement. So scan QR code, ask your question in Slido. Don't be nobody, nobody type your name there as well so we know who you are. Uh, keep your questions short and vote for others' questions so they can get promoted. When we see your question up top, we'll call your name, you come up and you speak directly to the master of Agile, Joe Justice, and he'll answer your question. So, and uh, while you are um, preparing for that, I will ask my first question. Um, I don't have the Slido yet, Vlad. Yeah, we share the Slido QR code. Oh. Sorry about that. I will reshare I, them. I actually I like to see Slido too. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's I need May I please say thank you to Thoroff joining from what is it, midnight? Were you Thoroff? Thank you so much. I, I'm so grateful and happy to see you again. True. And Jim D'Amato, some of you might not have met or know how awesome Jim is yet. Jim's been doing agile hardware for years and years and years now. And he's participated in events, some of which I was in too, with car companies, aircraft companies, aerospace, all over the world. So I definitely, please don't think only Joe Justice is this agile hardware thing. Jim's known about it for years and has been teaching it, consulting on it for years. And Thoroff runs a massive program at, for Carriot, part of Volkswagen. Uh, that does this, that is actually doing this, not in theory at all. Uh, so you have some superpowers here. Definitely don't think it's just Joe. Awesome, that's great, thank you. Uh, absolutely great. And okay, well, uh, oh, I need to move my stuff around. Okay, a little bit here maybe. So um, uh, my first question is, uh, is about the, uh, the transformation and uh, you have worked with many multinational, successful multinational organizations. And in your experience, uh, you, you come to a very hierarchical organization, uh, like a bank. Uh, how can that big organization then become flat uh, and transform? And what is maybe yours or maybe Elon Musk's approach could be? And specifically, how, how can it be done um, maybe is it possible to skip that financial financial incentives that you describe in your books uh, in the chapter switch? Uh, how how big of a deal to kind of have that financial transformation component? Vlad, you went right into the deep end right at the start. So I, I hope I hope all the audience is okay with going into the the challenge of the advanced part right away. Okay. What Elon Musk does, this is already what's very divergent from the frameworks that I was used to thinking in, and it's much more pure play agile. Um, and it should be named because agile is very broad and what Musk does is very specific, but it is also hyper agile. So it's not wishy-washy, you can do anything. It's very specific. There's clear lanes on how Musk conducts a business. Um, and is hyper agile. And what Musk does is he makes sure there's not central budgeting. 
that's insane to most companies, especially if you have a really wealthy family like the Pierce family, uh, Porsche pronounced uh, in other areas, who is the primary stakeholder in Volkswagen with 40% stake. They don't want to give up budgeting authority. If you're in Carriot, like Thoroff is, and you want to spend a certain number of million of euro, let's say 3 million euro, you need their approval. So you go through approval steps up through the food chain, and that takes months or quarters or years or is maybe never approved. And it consumes time and it justifies hierarchy because you have these people to weed out bad proposals and polish proposals until eventually they're good enough to show it to the Pierce family. That's central top-down command control management, which is not bad. It's actually very clear. What it is though, is it slow if they're not at the point of the decision. If they want to be sitting in a different office with different elevators or different cars, or actually even in a different country uh, on, or on a, on a yacht or something, if, if they're living a, a, a luxurious lifestyle, you are by definition away from the point of the decision. So there's a lag time and that's the problem. Now Musk in a way is super top down. Musk has full veto authority of everything at any time. What makes that work is Musk is there doing the engineering. Musk rotates through all the teams joining. We, we didn't use mob exactly, but it was super close to mob. So companies that are using mob or uh, what's the other more general term, uh, collaborative development, but uh, ensemble. Uh, hearing? Oh, uh, ensemble. Yeah, ensemble development. Uh, that's very close to what was actually happening in Tesla. I think if you did that for 10 years straight every day, it would very naturally be what's in Tesla already anyway. And I'd like to figure out a name for that because there aren't roles that we don't use a timer anymore, but it ends up being very similar to ensemble or mob or collaboration development. And Musk is in those as an engineer. Musk is drawing CAD, Musk is drilling holes in metal, Musk is loading 40, uh, 20 kilogram loads into robots, just like everybody else. So the feedback loop is so rapid. It's not like Musk is in some office somewhere. Musk does not have an office. Musk doesn't have a house. <laughs> Elon Musk sleeps in a sleeping bag in the factory. So Musk knows more about it than you do. Okay. <laughs> and so, so that's one. Musk does have full veto authority, but Elon is there. Then the second part is you're allowed to spend money. There is no central budgeting. Musk in, is incredibly active to make sure Musk has full veto authority. It's not a committee, it's Elon. It's a benevolent dictatorship in a very specific hyper agile way. And Elon makes sure everybody can spend money anytime. Now, this is why most companies, I think, aren't doing this yet, even though it pays off, even though it works so well. It's so fast. It's so fun. It makes tons of money is leadership needs to be on the shop floor all the time at the point of the information. And most investors, most people with the money don't want to do that. They want to have their money work for them, not work with their money. Most investors don't want to roll up their sleeves every day, consistently. So you either have lag or lack of information or both. And then they want to maintain central budgeting at the point where you know the least, not on the shop floor. And this is what creates waterfall. Now you want phases to protect your investment and make sure only the best proposals reach you and it disrupts you the least. It's actually a fundamental laziness that creates waterfall. And I will go even further and say, I believe this is the cause of many social ills. And I think Kantian philosophy, like there's an agile philosophy arising that actually could reshape governments in a good way. Like this is the real big thinking of our time in this era of enlightenment. Uh, and I think we agilists maybe have a useful perspective on it that most people haven't thought through yet. Uh, and, and this is the big pivot. So for something like a bank, Musk ran PayPal. Musk was part of the leadership team that ran PayPal and they absolutely attacked currency. And Musk ran it flat and Musk ran it with people have independent um, 
budgeting. They can execute on their own. And ultimately, Bus Musk was kicked out of PayPal. And the reason why is Musk thinks on a thousand year horizon or further. So if you're an investor and you want to get paid in five years or two years or 10 years, you would hate Musk most of the time because Musk says, let's keep putting all the money back into the company to maximize its disruption and it never ends. Now, Tesla is interesting because all the other competition is so slow by comparison that it still makes a ton of money, even though Elon puts all the money back into the company and Elon takes no salary and doesn't even own a house, right? That's how in Elon is. But Tesla, SpaceX, Neuralink are all on a thousand year or longer funding return horizon. And that's why they're killing everybody else financially, absolutely murdering all other competitors who try. Because other competitors are saying, how do we maximize for a two year from now exit, a five year from now exit, a 10 year from now exit? And Musk is saying, how do I maximize for humanity living out among the stars? And the timeline is so different that the time you have to financially compound is different. And Tesla will be the first $10 trillion company and even more in our lifetime because there's no intention to withdraw early and it creates different types of business decisions. Sounds like traditional banks do not have a chance. Oh, it is so <laughs> over. It's so over. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, that, that was great perspective. And my other question was actually in tune with the question that is currently up top. Uh, I am completely fascinated with the idea of three hour sprints and uh, uh, how the idea of sprint being shortest uh, time to release product to the customer combines with the extremely short sprints, like three hour sprints with daily scrum every 45 minutes, well, daily, quote, quote, daily. Uh, so, so, and how, uh, how can the feedback loop could be uh, used for NPI and PD? Uh, it seems like the customer feedback is not in, in the loop. Vlad, I love it because you know the answers as far as I know to this already. And it was it's cool. I saw a thumbs up from Jim D'Amato because he gets it too. He's done it. He's actually built hardware with me and, and also without me, I think, too, uh, in these short time boxes. So Jim's lived it. And I, I love it. You were humble enough to ask the question. But Vlad, you know what I'll say. Um, the trick is these things called the extreme manufacturing practices. And I honestly think those could be written better but they are written so that you can consume them, you can use them, but I think they could be more friendly, more elegant, right? I, I don't think they're optimized yet in terms of writing, but the content is correct. And what those practices do, those practices and principles do, and they're in the latest book I wrote, uh, Vlad, that you showed the cover of Scrum Master. It's chapter 10 XM or Extreme Manufacturing. What those practices do is allow something to go from definition of ready to definition of done in a shorter and shorter time. And all of those practices reinforce each other. So some companies maybe could only do one of the practices to start with. That's fine. Doing that practice will already shorten the time from definition of ready to definition of done, and it will allow for the company to do the next one or the next two. And as companies add these, they compound until it, it's quite magical. It starts to feel very ridiculously fast. It starts to feel like play. Like imagine if you were going to sit down and play with Legos. In three hours, you could build something. In 10 minutes, you could build something, you know, and it, it depends how skillful you are with Legos and what pieces you have and how clear it is to find them. But that's because Legos are hyper optimized. They have a known stable interface. They're modular. They're relatively walk-up simple. Most of the pieces have a similar recognizable geometry, even from a distance. They meet many of the XM practices. As your workshop, your factory, your design space, your collaborative vendor center starts to become more like Lego, the sprint length gets shorter and shorter. And this point was made for me several years back visiting Saab Aeronautics, Saab Defense in Linköping, Sweden with Paolo Samichelli, who subsequently wrote the book Scrum for Hardware. 
which is an awesome book. Uh, the first half I think is embarrassing. It's a story about how he and I met. So I, I find that phenomenally embarrassing. The second half is the engineering practices. So the second half of the book Scrum for Hardware, I think is perfect. And what Paulo writes is what they taught us at Saab Defense, Paulo and I. We had a, <laughs> but Jim D'Amato is holding up the cover. If you can see his window right now, he's holding up the book. It's probably even a, yeah, awesome. <laughs> What they told us is we had to architect the plane and they've made earlier versions of the plane, the Gryphon. They had to re-architect the jet. This is a multi-role joint strike fighter. So where every gram of weight matters, this is aerospace at the, at the top of defense. They had to re-architect the jet fighter to be modular and the head of structures, Jürgen Sobotoft, described it to us as we had to make the plane like Lego. And the point here, not to go too broad, is as you, you do re-architect things. It's not like you walk into a legacy product and tomorrow you have three hour sprints. No, there's work, there's re-architecture, there's re-architecting the company you're in. Uh, there is changing the way information is shared. You probably want different types of budgeting. So you're more nimble. If you're on a nine year plan, you can't act on a newly found opportunity in less than nine years without a change request, which might have defense around it, might be defended. So you probably want different budgeting. You probably want agile budgeting. You, you might want LAP, Lean Agile Procurement, that Merco Kleiner is making very clear in Europe. You probably want agile HR. As you add these things, the sprint length gets shorter and shorter and shorter from definition of ready to definition of done until it is basically like playing with Lego. And a good example of this is all around Tesla, you have machines. And next to them, you have a library of materials. Because what you're making changes every day. You're making improvements. So you don't have just a lean stack of only the materials you used yesterday, because you might use different materials tomorrow. So you have a library. And some of the library is 100 meters away, but you have automated forklifts and humans with forklifts and carts that can bring you stuff and or you can go get it in five minutes or less. But you have an immediately accessible library, not just it's not your traditional lean Kanban where there's only what you need now, because it's constant innovation. So you've got this library, then you have a machine. And the goal is you could touch the machine or at least the plastic protectors on the side, the plexiglass protectors, and you could touch the inventory and you could touch the means to design, which is usually a set of computers or laptops without stepping. That's the dream. So it's like you're in a phone booth as, as, you, as you'd wish, or a little bigger, and you can touch the, the materials, you can touch the machine, or at least it's protective shielding, you can touch usually your computer, the means of design. That is part of it that makes this fast. And again, think if you're playing Lego and your Lego is at your friend's house, a 15 minute drive away. So you're like drawing what you're gonna build in Lego on paper. And then you have a meeting with your spouse and they like give you change requests. We haven't actually played with any Lego yet. How soon are you gonna build your Lego friend's catamaran? It might take longer than if you had the pieces right there on the table. And if you needed to get approval of your spouse, what color the slide should be, they're right there and you could ask, right? It actually is extremely common sense stuff. And something that struck me when I was in Tesla is how much it felt like I was playing Lego. But I'll balance that with how huge this stuff is. There was a time where I had a set of tools that I had just made with a team. We've made it together. To, to complete a certain operation in my teeth. And I was crawling through a four story tall robot while it was moving. I mean, there is straight up special forces stuff. So it's different than just Lego. I, the nearest analogy I really have, and some of you may have seen a YouTube I just did with Farzad who just retired from Tesla after four years there. And Farzad says, they went through five different inbound and outbound, sorry, three different inbound and outbound procurement processes, new robots, new training, new conveyor belts, new truck docking, new parking spaces in five months. He said, most companies do that once a year, make a change, if ever. 
And he said, we did three in five months. The pace of change is insane. New robots, new software, new training. I mean, the pace of change is unreal. And we were talking and I was just, this is on YouTube now with Farzad, another interesting conversation. And Farzad's talking about how fast it was and me too. And we're, we're, we almost have PTSD, but in a fun way about it. And I'd just been listening to hardcore history, supernova in the East, talking about the battle of uh, Iwo Jima and that kind of thing. And that's the nearest I've ever seen or ever heard anyone talk about what it felt like to work in Tesla. No, there was not mass death like the Battle of Iwo Jima. You, you didn't have that. But on either side, there's this, you have no idea what's going to happen next, but you know it's going to be fast. And it's often described as this workmanlike. It, it, it's, it's like the, the, the workshop of, of war. I mean, horrible that people are, are, are dying. Okay, so minus the dying but that you have no idea what's going to go what's going to happen next you don't know when you get to go to the bathroom uh things are fast but you're methodical and i've never experienced like that anywhere except in the build parties that i did with wikispeed so for those of you like jim he's got the wikispeed shirt on who've been in a wikispeed build party that is exactly what it feels like in tesla every day for 12 hours or longer, I would do 15 hours most of the time. Then I did go to SpaceX as well when I was a Tesla employee, both Boca Chica and the headquarters in Hawthorne, it was the same. Uh, also part of the Boring Company, it was, it was the same. It's, it's war. Luckily, it's extremely safe and there's really good coffee, but it is war. That's amazing, amazing story, <laughs> awesome. War a split in three hour sprints with the feedback loop from your testing <laughs> and uh, uh, understanding that your, your innovation actually works and can apply and, and provide value uh, every time you, you fork your, uh, your, your innovative branch. Yeah, awesome, thank you. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I wanted to uh, let uh, the, the co-host here ask their questions. And, and Sam, could you, could you please ask your questions um, uh, whatever you prepare? Thank you. Yeah, sure. And I'm going to reduce mine to just one because we've got lots of great questions from the audience too. So um, I'll be brief so we get, get a chance to work through more than ones in Slido. Um, Joe, thanks again for making time for us. This amazing conversation already. Uh, great to meet you. Um, so, so my question kind of lines, lines back up to what you were talking about initially in terms of how, how we tackle the budgeting, right? So um, one of the things we talk about a lot in, in large scale Scrum is this kind of statement that, that Craig Larman, uh, uh, co-creator of, of LESC, uh, kind of comes across as um, we want to be able to um, reduce the cost of change, right? Uh, turn on a dime for a dime is this kind of statement on that. So how... Um, can you talk a little bit about why that's an important concept in terms of just lowering the overall cost of change when you start to coach teams that are kind of pursuing this sort of agility? Well, Sam, I, if you don't mind, I'd actually like to hear your answer. I've, I've got one, but I think you've thought about this in a nuanced way, the way you asked that question. I actually, if you don't mind, would you answer it? And I'll also weigh in too, if, if you still want to. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, I've, I, I've worked with a lot of kind of, you know, medium and large organizations, and we run into these sort of um, challenges in terms of, well, how, how do we actually make this decision and, and kind of the underlying latency around those problems? And it, oftentimes it feels like, um, you know, the, the smaller the team is, like you, you guys doing this little, you know, kind of experiment over here, that's okay. We, we don't need to um, worry too much about that. But as we get you know, more on the line and, and now we're more serious, we've got more actual capital at stake or whatever, all of a sudden it's kind of like, well, you know, we better check with some people first, basically. <laughs> and, and that results in this, this, you know, form of waste, right? That it's, it's kind of an invisible waste because it's just sort of expected that, well, we're, we're serious business people and um, this is how we should be making decisions. We should go through this kind of governance and everything else. Um, so it, it feels like it's the right thing to do. It's the safer, more mature, you know, professional thing to do, et cetera. And, you know, 
but if you do the math on it, you really look at the effect that it has on innovation, it's poison, right? Or at least in my opinion, it is. So it, it feels like there's it, there's a conversation there that um, we we try and have, and oftentimes it feels like, well, you guys are just a bunch of hippies talking about this stuff, you know. <laughs> So I'm I'm curious with your experience and background, you know, kind of working with, um, you know, senior leaders in these organizations, how how have you approached that sort of conversation and how would you, um, you know, kind of suggest that we tackle that in, in our areas of coaching, right? Sam, that's awesome. Sam, that's awesome. Uh, so at Tesla, I was never asked to calculate cost of delay. The, the argument was already over, right? It, Tesla has been going for years and years and it's now the by market cap, the far and away the most valuable automotive company on planet Earth. So the, the, the argument's over in Tesla. I was never asked to calculate cost of delay. What I did in other companies before Tesla, which may help, so I'll suggest, is I calculated cost of delay. Or I would ask whoever was trying to withhold budget and not, not allow people to make decisions freely. I would ask them, how much would you pay to have this arrive one year earlier? How much would you pay to have this arrive one month earlier? Or I would even divide it and then get a cost per hour. You know, if it were one hour earlier, it's worth 11,000 euro. Okay, well, if it's a thousand hours earlier, you know, and, and do the math. And I'd post that big and publicly so now we could all collaboratively make decisions in real time. That works, that works well. So I'll, I'll, I'll suggest that. Um, this might be vind uh, vindicative, this might help uh, all of us, is to say in, in, in Tesla, there's no withholding of budgeting, not that I ever experienced. No one had to calculate cost of delay because it's so obviously correct. Uh, it, and this is, is actually baked into Silicon Valley. Now, Silicon Valley in some ways has had some old money enter it. And so there's mm -hmm. some slow pockets now, but the yeah. early Silicon Valley, which is still the majority culture, doesn't do budgeting the same way. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, okay. Doesn't do budgeting the same way. Instead of making a nine year financial plan like Volkswagen publicly just did, I mean, this was in Reuters, Volkswagen making their nine year financial plan. Well, how agile is that? Um, instead, what Silicon Valley does is they measure the burn rate. So it's here's how much money we have in the bank, and that's called your runway. And how fast are you consuming it, which is your burn rate. And the encouragement is to actually spend it as fast as you can to maximize your burn rate, as long as it is efficient. So instead of any budgeting, instead of any withholding, instead of any earmarking of funds, there, that's frowned upon because it's slow. Instead of that, st standard Silicon Valley money practice. Don't budget, don't say what it's for next month, next week, definitely not next year, because that would be unagile. You wouldn't be able to respond to emerging information. I mean, what are you gonna do when there's the chip shortage, supplier delays, rebudget? <laughs> Why? That's just waste. So instead, you, you want measures of efficiency of capital, capital allocation. And if you listen to any Musk financial interviews, that's all Musk talks about. And Musk's really interesting conversations, I think, on the efficacy of government are around the efficiency of capital allocation. And Musk says government is the least efficiency form of business for capital allocation. So here's the reasons, here's where you wouldn't want to use government. Now, where you would want to use government is in these type of auditing services, where here is why it is net net a value add. So Musk doesn't say no government, Musk says, definitely not government for anything that is traditionally considered a business operation. Instead, use government for safety guidelines like FDA and um, standardized airports, airport communications. You don't want Airbus having completely different communications than Boeing. You want them to be able to talk to each other. So the FAA is a good thing. Um, known stable interfaces, right? You want government mandating known stable interfaces only and testing those rapidly and for free. Okay, well, back to budgeting. The concept is maximize your burn rate. And I think a lot of companies don't get this. I, and I grew up in the Midwest. Many of the people here said they're from the Twin Cities, definitely not all, Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, and the surrounding areas. 
And I was taught a very different type of conservative finance. And there are many huge, wonderful, helpful, trustworthy companies in the Midwest. So it's not wrong. But if you want growth, if you want innovation, you want to maximize your burn rate. And the reason that's not killing every company is companies that measure the efficiency well. And that was the top metric per team in Tesla. It was not velocity. That actually didn't have a meaning apart from capital efficiency. It was, it was money efficiency and specifically how that was measured. If you want to try this for your household, you want to try this for your grocery budget, or you want to try this for your company, which I do all of the above, is what Tesla does. It's operational expense, expenditures, OPEX, and then added to plus CapEx, capital expenditure. So take how much it costs for me to live in this condo, including the maintenance fee and I, whatever the, the total cost is, and divide that by day, right? So now I have the cost of using this capital, and I would use that for machinery or like my car or my refrigerator, you know? So you have your capital efficiency and then your operational efficiency, you just add those together. And then you have some estimate of the value you gave to the company. And this can't be shorter than your sprint length. This can't be shorter than your definition of ready to definition of done cycle. So if right now that's 18 months, that's the fastest you can measure because you don't have a value measure until you release something. And if it's zero value or negative value, it's good to know that. If it's positive value, you try to assess how much. And so now you have a value number. Value divided by CapEx plus OpEx was the top and in some cases only measure of an agile team at Tesla, period. And what that does is it makes you maximize your burn rate efficiently. You want efficiency to be going up and everybody can see it. You don't have to log in. It's on monitors everywhere. It's on your phone. It's popping up, like shouting at you, your capital efficiency, everyone else's. You can see it. Where's CapEx good? Where's CapEx not good? And you can use the law of two feet, like an open space conference to go help if you think you can help. And the whole company manages itself essentially on that at the surface. And that is, if you add every car company's value together, they are worth less than Tesla again today. And that is how all the teams measure themselves. So for a structure like less, like large scale scrum, I think if you tried to add the way Tesla does self budgeting, automated self budgeting, that might be a really interesting evolution of less and already get much closer to what I'm trying to process that I thought I experienced in Tesla. Uh, awesome question, Samuel. How do you react to that? Great insights. I, I really appreciate it. it and the, the background in terms of how it was applied to Tesla is very helpful for me too, Joe. And that's why we could just go out and buy a robot. We didn't have to ask anybody. I, what you would do is ask, where do we get the cheapest robots right now? But you'd ask that through chat because you'd want an answer in less than 60 seconds. Uh, hilariously, the first Starship, which is the largest rocket ever made by humans, the first one is called Star Hopper. When, when asked, why did you make the landing legs out of this diameter of steel tube? The answer was, that was the largest diameter of steel tube we could get delivered from Amazon in less than 24 hours. <laughs> How's that? This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so now we know that Starship is flying on Amazon legs. <laughs> yeah, it was. Now they now they do extrude their own, but that's because they made their own extruder and they can actually extrude faster than order from Amazon. But it started. Yeah, it, they use Amazon McMaster car. I mean, it's it's full on whatever you can get the fastest. Awesome, it's awesome. I, I remember that uh, David wanted to ask a question about walk up simple. David. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, it's kind of a multi-layered question. Um, the first is making things, and I've watched a couple of your videos on YouTube, and I suggest other people look up Joe Justice, Walk Up Simple. There's a lot of great um, podcasts out there. So I watched some of that. One of my question, lingering questions around that was, is it the same as having a definition of ready, um, like for refinement in order for a team to agree to bring a PBI into a sprint planning? Um, there's some, there's like, uh, maybe even more than half the scrum community is like at odds with 
the, the, the idea of definition of ready, because sometimes teams will make it a contract. They're not willing to kind of um, take a problem into a sprint and try and work through it and figure it out. So how do you, diff is, there, is there a difference or how do you strike a Hi. balance of ambiguity that um, teams are, are, should be comfortable uh, with to uh, start working on something? Like awesome. And if you're not on mute, can you go on mute, please? Thank you. Somebody's talking in the background, thanks. That said, please interject intentionally. But if, Unless uh, you have a question, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, David, awesome points. It, it is different. So, um, and, and I think you get this. I, I think you asked a clever leading question. That's very kind of you. Um, but maybe it's useful to the whole group to, to say what I think I learned. Um, the idea is that you can see where to add value instantly without asking anybody. And definition of ready supports that and helps maintain that. And definition of done, like self-documenting code in the case of code or make the tools in your NAC, which is a, this, this like vending machine for tools, um, make those clean and organized. So you can easily see what's in there and what's not. Um, but it has more to do with visibility. And the goal, which is actually one of the extreme manufacturing practices, the goal is from standing in one place, you can see everything you need to complete the next sprint goal basically the next move. You can't always do that, but that's the goal to get towards that. So if it's software, it's not like it's in GitHub, but part of it is over here and part of it is in COBOL hosted by a vendor. Uh, you can start that way, but then your first sprint goal would be increasing the walk up simple, um, where eventually, for example, code, because I think a lot of people here are doing software, um, in code, you'd you, your dream is to get to a domain specific language that's self-documenting with no documents, no comments, right? The classes are clear. It's a domain, it's a DSL that it says, here's what I'm trying to do. And then the name of the call is, here's what I'm trying to do. And here's my self-checking, here's my test harness. And the test harness runs itself continuously. That, that's what you want, that's the dream. That's walk up simple. Uh, in fact, if you think back to your computer science classes, some of the lab TAs made, I think all of us, really good learning tools where they would say, here's a code problem that's nearly code complete, but you can see it's very clear. It's, it's self-documenting, it's in a DSL, the test harness is here, but you can see this test is red. You can see this test is red. Figure out what to do to make this test green. That's what you want. That's walk up simple. And definition of ready, definition of done, aid maintaining that or creating that, but it's not the same. In hardware, it's what I started to talk about where hopefully you could touch the machine or at least its safety cage and you could touch the materials and you can touch the means of production because that also means you can see it you can hear it the machine's making a different sound than it was yesterday you want to know that even if you think you're a designer because no one is single stack in tesla right you want to know the machine's making a different sound it's time for you to start to learn what that means in terms of the life cycle of that machine and <laughs> maybe my design was inappropriate it's too deep for the machine and it's making a different sound. And so that it's actually a bad design. It's not a maintenance issue. I'm, I'm within the written tolerance of the machine, but not within the practical and applied tolerance of the machine. That sound is telling me this. So you want that feedback. In fact, when you're changing design, sometimes in less than an hour, you have to have that feedback because there's no one to call that can be there faster than you, right? Um, so walk up simple is you could see everything clearly how to add value. This also aids in swarming and becoming cross-functional. If an if a interested, open-minded person with no experience walks up to you, how many minutes until they can be adding value? That is a prime level metric. So if, if you have a competent, skillful human being who is alert, interested, and engaged, and passionate, but they have no experience in what you're doing. How many minutes until they're adding value? That is the test of walk-up simple. Those are really good examples that cleared it up for me. Thank you. I think Thank you already, David, you're super humble. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything you want to add? Because you are familiar with the topic. Um, 
I don't think I have anything to add. It was, I was just trying to really formulate in my mind what is the difference because it didn't seem like they're the same thing, but they're related. The definition of ready and the walk up simple. Um, but from, from what I took away from that is, yeah, like how quickly can we um, get skillful, smart, competent people able to add value, um, you know, in a given sprint, whether, you know, sometimes I think about when I have worked at companies, it takes two weeks to get the laptop ready for, for the engineer. And they're like sitting on their hands and like reading books and manuals, like what's going on here, you know? And uh, so, I mean, but I mean, even in, inside of a sprint with, with a team that's already, um, you know, up to speed, you know, can they start working right away? Uh, do they, do, you know, do they know where all the automated tests are located that they could run um, and, and are the, all, is the code documented? Um, you know, well, so they can, you know, maneuver around through the code, maintain it and all that. So that makes a lot of sense to me. I appreciate it. Thank you. I will propose this is what refinement should grow into. Mm -hmm. I, it's, it wasn't before when I was in like Solutions IQ years back where we had 150 Agilists trying to do great Agile. This isn't what we meant by a refinement at that time. But there's a concept called kitting, kitting, making a kit, which means like David, you just said, where the laptop is ready, it's already configured, you just open it and you could go, right? It's kitted, it's kitted for you. If mm. you use a trackball, it's already there, you know, whatever. If you prefer a treadmill desk, you're, it's already there, right? That's kitted, it's ready. That's part of the definition of ready, right? Ideally. So refinement, I think a lot of people think it means more like story splitting and estimation. Um, at least that's how it started. And maybe that's what we needed at the time. I'll propose this. Somebody please name this, this new agile, whatever, whatever it is Tesla's doing, the Musk model. It sounds good, but I mean, then that means every time Musk changes their mind, we have to rewrite all the books. So, which maybe is a good thing. I don't know. I don't know. But do we really want Musk being the next uh, Ken Schwaber? I, I don't know. But anyway, whatever we call this new agile, <laughs> agile 4.20. <laughs> Agile 69. What do we call it? Um, refinement, I think, would involve kidding. So it would involve like we let's refine together. That means we're all going to install these tools on each other's laptops and make sure they're configured. We're all going to make sure check out and check in are working the way we thought they were. We're we're all going to clean up this area of our environment. Um, let, we're, we're going to make sure the two people that wanted treadmill desks have them. We're going to set them up, make sure they're working. Um, and now there's an end table that can set their coffee on, coffee cup on. That's the right height for when you're on the treadmill, right? So you, I, I think that's what refinement should become. And I did that a lot at Tesla and we didn't call it anything. It was just what we did. There was a, a lot of making it walk up simple, more walk up simple progressively. And some people will call that 5S or 7S. So that gives us some vocabulary to cling on to. It's not, it's not the same. Uh, it's more than that. It's, it's agilification. It's increasing the agility. If I was a red hot chili pepper, I'd name my ad album agilification. Um, <laughs> but, but there's this intentional time spent uh, rapidly as a team swarming on increasing the, the walk up simple, walk up simplicity. And I think that is, if we chose to continue keeping the word refinement, or I actually never disliked grooming. I, I thought that was fine. Now, whatever the Daily Mail wants to say doesn't mean they changed my vocabulary. It's still a good, <laughs> um, I, I, I think it could become this, increasing the agility, the agilification. Mm, that's a really interesting perspective. I like that. Thank you. It's, it's amazing, Joe, that you have so many uh, great analogies like Lego, uh, kidding, uh, I actually uh, can, can, uh, took a lot from your workshop. I just went straight to retrospective and, 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 and told the, the, this concept to people and they just, it just clicked uh, right away. Uh, you know, it, it's awesome. It's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. So um, <laughs> we, have, uh, we have many questions. I want to get to questions. And uh, at the same time, Joe, I wanted to quick, quickly check with you how much more time we have with you. 
Oh, well, it, there's the whole group and people have their all their schedules. Um, I could stay on until 15 minutes after the hour if folks really wanted it or if there was some hard care, hardcore group that wanted it. All right, sounds good. Well, let's start with the first question. It's uh, from Anonymous, but uh, if you can identify yourself, get on uh, off mute and ask a question to Joe, please. That's uh, up top. What question is this? This is on top uh, what what we have for uh, number one with eight votes. Uh, what is your recommended way of convincing this suite? Okay, well, Joe, what is your recommended way of convincing this suite to change organizational design, please? <laughs> facilitator. Th thank you for fishing for the engagement that we all wanted and it, the timing was missed, but thank you for filling in. Vlad, you're fantastic. Thank you. Um, okay. I, there's, there's like the real answer and the more diplomatic answer. Um, the, the, the real answer is you have to be comfortable releasing funds, releasing control of funds. And then so how to get there, right? If, if you, if you want to be as quick as SpaceX, you have to be comfortable like handing your credit card to someone else. That, that's basically how this, how this works. And, and that's a, a fundamental mindset shift. Um, so there are stepping stones towards that, right? Like you have on one end, the, a, a, I will say a wonderful introduction for a lot of really slow companies. If you cannot release in less than a year, I will say use Scaled Agile Framework use it. If you cannot release in less than a year, safe is for you. Then if you cannot release in less than a month, you probably want Scrum, Scrum at scale. If you can't release in a week or less, now you're probably ready for less. You're probably there. And at some point you start to get to continuous releases, but you still want to have some governance or at least be compatible with investment and be able to answer legal questions. And this is the realm of what Tesla and SpaceX are doing. And so I think we do need to, to some extent, codify this so more companies can do it legally. But, but that's where you get into this. So I will, oh, controversial, we're, we're in the less meetup. I will say, I think you would eventually even transcend from less even but I think we're towards the fast end of the spectrum. Okay. So with that- I was gonna say, but is that is that really controversial in a framework that says, dear God, only do it if you have to, right? Right, yeah. Rule I mean, number one, right? Don't scale. In <laughs> right? right. I, I, I love it. There, there's some real honesty baked in um, and, and I respect that a lot. Um, so you have this rainbow as all propose it are frameworks and when to use each. And the answer to this depends on how aggressive the C-suite is. If they're releasing in more than a year, it takes them longer than a year to release now, probably your recommended way to convince them is much more gentle and introductory, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it might be scaled agile or something, right? If you're in a shop that's already releasing every week or less, or even multiple days with CI, CD, the way you can interact and convince that group is super different, right? But in all cases, the end result is updating company policy around everything, because it all reinforces. If you have a ladder of salary, now you've introduced a game that's about increasing your status on the ladder and not about work, right? So that is a fundamental distraction when you're going super fast. Um, so HR will probably move closer to Agile HR the way Rena Hellstrom talks about it, right? So maybe you're, you're gonna talk about Agile HR first. Uh, but in any case, eye on the prize. The, the goal, the best I understand it, is new hires have full ability to spend money, even large amounts, but they have a real-time financial efficiency metric. There's no career ladder. Everyone is paid based on total company performance. So people are incented the right way. Stock price is a great way to do that. At Tesla, you actually make almost no money, but you have awesome stock perks. And so your primary income is stock. And that creates a really good culture. 
no one is hunting to get the next step up the ladder because there's no ladder. There's no career ladder to climb. You're, you're just employee. Like, I do think it's like, I, I was not there. I don't mean to belittle it because no one is dying, but I do think it's like Iwo Jima on either side, whether you're in a bunker or you're landing on the beaches and like either way, you're not worried about your next rank at that moment. You, that is not the problem, <laughs> right? You're like, how do I solve this next objective? <laughs> and you want that. You, you, you want to take the game away from anything except success towards the mission. And so to talk to the C-suite, you talk about mission and you talk about how fast you want to go. And then you could have framework discussions maybe. Um, but I mean, Elon doesn't have any time for frameworks. They're all too slow. Then Elon is willing to go. And Elon is willing for you to make a million dollar mistake if you make a hundred million dollar win the next day, which happens all the time. So as a new hire, you can make a million dollar mistake. And if it wasn't stupid, like, like you decided to just drive a forklift into the side of the new Tesla semi because you thought it was funny, that would just be stupid. You'd be fired immediately, right? That would be stupid. But if it wasn't stupid, you made a machine in good faith uh, you made a decision in good faith and it ended up being a, a very wrong decision, you'd definitely not be fired. You'd be encouraged. You'd be on a team. And yeah, you could blow a million dollars on the wrong thing. And that is, what's the tolerance level? So in all cases, I, because I do now consult, is I do what's called a leadership workshop, like many of you do. And I try to lay out this rainbow and say, what do you want? do you have investors that are extremely risk averse and you are accountable to them now notice this question was asked c-suite in most cases that means you don't actually own any of the money or the company the board does so you are actually accountable to the board's whims and wishes and you're back in the pierce family volkswagen carriage situation where you have phenomenal agility that's bottlenecked by nine-year budgeting that's what happens when you have a C-suite. Now, if you have a C-suite that's also the president and the secretary and the treasurer, and they're also board members, if you have a board, now you can actually be making decisions. You, you have this interesting dynamic where, where, you, where you have actually change authority, structural and financial change authority. Now that's different. So if this question were worded as, what is your recommended way of convincing the board members? I would have one question. It's what's your cash out horizon? And if they say it's two years, it would be a completely different answer than if they say, I'm thinking in terms of three generations. And as a stepping stone, so people have something actionable, cost of delay is awesome. It solves for many of these and it points all the way to the goal. So we can start with cost of delay. So well, how do you feel about cost of delay? Have you seen cost of delay on your three flagship products? What would you pay for them to ship tomorrow? What would that be worth financially to the company? And now you can fund the transformation because they say that'd be worth a million euro. That'd be worth a billion euro, depends, right? That'd be worth a trillion to Tesla. It would It'd be worth a trillion um, dollars. So now you can fund the transformation. If you get fired so at Tesla, who does it? What's that, Tomo? If you get fired at Tesla, who does the firing in a flat organization? Yeah, okay. So anyone can hire, anyone can fire, but it is enforced by there are two HR groups. And they do, they also use agile people operations, but primarily they use, they, they act just like agile people operations, but primarily they use the word HR just for legal understanding. There is an HR group that will sign the document, but basically what it means is anyone said, this person needs to be canned and here's why. And so, so I, how, to, how to say that? HR is kind of like the pen or the document. Humans actually run the company and it's any human. <laughs> but it's not like someone can fire you because they don't like you, right? Like there, there is at least due diligence of did they truly do something in absolute malicious intent to harm uh, 
and in a way where they did not show remorse and they're not savable. I mean, it's a really high bar. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of love and goodwill. And Farzad talks about that extremely uh, at length in Farzad's YouTube channel as a Tesla four-year veteran. Thank you. For example, when I was hired, it was one of the one of the people in Tesla said, we need more people of a skill set like this, I think. They posted on LinkedIn. HR then edited it, made the grammar even better, you know, took time, but like they posted and then HR like tidied. Um, as they're like a service. They're not in the way. They're not a bottleneck. They like help after. Um, and I responded and uh, they talked to me. And then once I was hired, like everybody, I could then go anywhere. But someone said, we need someone like this. So they put themselves and actually their name was on my hiring. And they are in, um, how to say it, they, they have a special relationship with you for at least the first 90 days and forever after if they want to. Um, and actually they get financial incentives if you're awesome because they went out and said, I want you. So, so they placed their bet. And by the way, I was told I was the best interview Tesla had ever had. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. We'll talk about this definitely because uh, Elon Musk is famous for, for asking some questions during the interview. But uh, I, I, I want to uh, give a chance to Warren Mav to come online and ask a question if you're still Thank around. You. Hi, Joe. Um, so my question to you really is more of a personal one is, how did you find your why in the Agile world? What, what, what makes you tick in the Agile world? Man, Warren, you're, you're so phenomenal. Uh, very topical, very timely. Um, in some ways, I found a very, very clear set of whys, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to get there because you might like that. And in some ways, I'm swimming right now. So really good timing, Warren. So I'm not gonna say I've got it all figured out because in some ways I really am, am floating. Uh, and in some ways I have a very clear set of whys. And I, I will say exactly what, what worked for the, for the parts that worked well. And maybe this helps somebody and maybe you like it. Um, there's a feeling I get in my tummy sometimes that I and truly it's a feeling um, like a roller coaster gives you a feeling or drinking a lot of warm tea on a cool day gives you a feeling and, and it is a feeling when I feel I am doing my life's work. Uh, and some people might describe it like flow state, but that often is accommodated with a sense of uh, loss of awareness of time. It's different than that. Um, for, for me, it's actually... I mean, I'm sure everybody's different, but I, I will very personally, Joe Justice's way is it feels like I can move as fast as physics would allow in any direction at any time. And, and I can't, right? I can only run so fast. I can only jump so fast, but I, I feel like I could move at the speed of light and it, it's centered in my tummy. Actually, that's where I feel it. I feel like I could go speed of light in any dimension in an instant. And some things create that feeling in me. And I feel so free, I feel so agile. And it doesn't mean I'm free. I mean, I might actually, I don't know, be in COVID in quarantine or whatever, right? But uh, the, the feeling is there. And when I was starting Wikispeed, some decisions gave me that feeling and some didn't. And interestingly, when I followed those decisions, the team grew. Hundreds more people wanted to be a part of it. Um, when parts of the book, uh, Scrum Master, when I wrote them, I had that feeling. And parts of the book, when I wrote them, I didn't have that feeling. And reading the book again, I can see how different the quality of the book is. So I hope to edit and improve, right? Because uh, there are some sections that just should be deleted or, or repurposed or something. So this feeling was incredibly valuable for me. And what that does is it continually created a why. Now I did also then try personal agility with Maria Mattarelli as my coach and we created a forces map. And what that did is it did help articulate, it helped clarify what some of the forces were that created that feeling somehow, sometimes. 
It didn't make the feeling happen more often, but it helped me talk about it better. Uh, so the forces map was useful. Uh, and I do think personal agility might be exactly the right answer for a lot of stages of life. Um, and, and it has a forces map and a what matters, what really matters board uh, and a, a, a coaching system. Um, and I do find it useful, but I will say just in honesty, it didn't create that feeling more often. Then there's some choices in life that are big deal decisions. Uh, like are, they have a high cost to reverse the decision or change. So they're one way or near one way. Like, should I marry this person? Yes, there is such a thing as marrying again, but there's a high cost to that. <laughs> so, so these types of decisions, or should I buy this house, right? I mean, yeah, you can sell a house, but there is a cost to that. You, you're closing off other options and dedicating some time and a lot of money towards this. Whereas, you know, should I go for a walk? It's different, right? <laughs> large decisions, this hasn't helped me. And I still really have felt it, felt, felt it. I really have felt like I'm floating and ungrounded and my why in the agile world for some decisions that were super clear to me, like, should I create this new business or should I join this business? Should I take this board of advisors position or should I focus on the next book, which is part of the why in the agile world? This has been hard. But then there are some truism statements that I think most people here will agree with that have created part of my current why. And that is, if all 8 billion near, I think we're at 7.8 billion people on planet Earth right now, if all 8 billion people on planet Earth did it, would it be better? That to me helps find the agile practices that are open and embracing and helps me notice and, and weed out the practices that are actually command control centralization structures. So if all 8 billion people did this agile practice, would the world be a superior place? Would it be closer to the future that I, would, that I wish would exist the best I can predict the future? I find that super valuable and it helps me kick out Ponzi scheme, bad agile, junk like that. Um, and then another is, does this increase the pace of good change? Uh, Musk sums it up as pace of innovation is the only thing that matters. So does this shorten the sprint length and does it increase the innovation per sprint? And there's a lot of stuff that doesn't. Um, in fact, there's a lot of stuff that creates what I might have thought were good agile values, but it actually does not increase the piece of innovation or shorten the sprint length. So it lets me throw those right out and focus on pace of innovation is the only thing that matters in the long run, which I find hyper useful. And then way out there, what's work without style? And if truth is beauty, how do we add beauty to this? And I love the concept of elegance in programming versus just get it done. And elegance, trying to apply that the way expert software people think of elegance, apply that back to life and style and beauty and thinking cute is important. The sound of something is important. Working in Japan, sound of something, the way something feels, the perfect imperfections are really applauded. And I think it matters. I think it really matters. Now, conversely, your time or anyone's time is not valued in Japan. I have never seen anything so slow ever as working in Japan. And I would go to the hallmark, Toyota Hall. Toyota, uh, what's it, Kai, the, the Toyota Hall, um, the home of lean. And there's signs that say you're in the home of, it is so slow. It is, you can't get anything done. And I go, wow, they need lean or else it would just be stopped. Like, it is so slow. Um, so if you put pace of innovation as the only thing that matters in the long run, with this beautiful appreciation for the sound, feel, touch, structure, style, and cuteness of something, I, I think you get towards the why of Agile and the society that you might want to scale out among the stars. That's fantastic. Thanks, Chuck. Beautiful Warren, answer. <laughs> folks, we are at, at time. I, I talked way too long on too few things and I did not listen enough. 
what I will say is if any one of you would like to, please record your Zoom saying what you want to ask or tell me. And I mean, you could use any better recording system than this, but you can just record Zoom, like with a room with just you in it. And send the link to me and tag Twin Cities Less and tag me and I'll reply. And that way we'll actually get to know each other. I mean, you could just type it, which is also awesome. But if you did make a video, we would actually know what each other looks like, how we talk. And one day if we ever met and had a coffee or a beer, depending on time of day, we, we would already be friends. And if this conversation resulted in more of us having a more human connection, that's probably a good thing. And if it increases pace of innovation in your company or your studies or your personal life, that's also probably a good thing. So I, I didn't get to talk or listen enough. Please tweet at me, I'm at Joe Justice. And if you make a video clip, even better. Or, or LinkedIn is great, but let's be good friends. Especially if you've already recorded something, if you've recently done a session or if you wrote a book, make sure I know where it is so I can see it, I can read it. Thank you very, 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 very much. Awesome, thank you so much, Joe. And I would like to add, everybody please read uh, joe's book it's transformational uh, it, it's got so much in there uh, mind-blowing like step-by-step -step instructions examples uh, and analogies it's perfect it's just great uh, and for for the all levels you know the experts uh, and the beginners and they uh, also recommend the uh, uh, joe's uh, workshop that i, I attended uh, uh, the uh, agile hardware so th that was uh, phenomenal even for a software person like me so thank you so much joe glad you are so kind thank you thank you thank you and i saw tom old here i saw Munwai here I, joel awesome to see you thorough phenomenal to see you i jim wonderful to see you it's a small world after all and it's my honor and privilege I do consider the two-day Agile Hardware Developer course, um, th that's the one plug I'll make, which you already made for me, Vlad. Thank you so much. Uh, truly, my honor and privilege. Thank you, everybody. Let's be friends on LinkedIn and Twitter. Vlad, great to see you again. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, back to David uh, to, to wrap it up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, no problem. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, we do have Lean Coffee next month, so please join us for that if you want to have some kind of in the trenches talks about implementing less um, or just looking for support. We'd be glad to have you join our community. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Would would yeah. anyone be would I, either of the organizers be open or willing to hang out a little bit longer so that those of us who feel like staying and talking about what we've learned could. Mm -hmm. Could do that oh absolutely yeah for okay. sure yeah we we're planning on going till 7 p.m central so oh okay that's another 40 minutes anyway so yeah well sharon <laughs> did you have something you wanted to ask since you're uh, since uh you're joking? thank Hi, you joe. joe i didn't mean to hold you here longer i i don't have anything yeah. that i have to ask but <laughs> thank you joe <laughs> um i i i mean i guess there's there's things that I'm thinking about, but I want to hear what other people have to say first. Maybe let's put it that like that. What was something? I, I mean, I think this was a very unusual and interesting um, thing to listen to. You know, really, um, he said a lot of things that I don't hear that often. So, what does what does everyone else have to say about this? I think I think for me and, and hi to all the guys and girls I've worked with before, um, I think for me, the big question is what kind of a company do we want to work for? And can these big publicly listed U.S. corporations ever become anywhere near as agile as what he described? Because um, that management model with Elon Musk, that does not compute in any corporate environment. So, so I'm just thinking about what is the practical application? Should we all up and leave the big corporates and go to <laughs> go to startups? Or what is the, uh, it, it all seems to be about the management philosophy. That's the fundamental thing here. 
But is, is it, isn't it more related to the mission, right? Because he's trying to, he has created a company, right? And has been radically funded. I mean, think about it for a second. Like the, the tens of billions of dollars in cash they've burned. Right? And I don't mean that in a negative way. Because like when you're doing a startup, and you're ramping up, like you don't have money at the end of the year, right? Your job is to invest that money, spend it and burn through it. But when they, they're in a, a unique situation where they're trying to massively disrupt and if you're in a system that frankly isn't ready for that or, or or won't value that ever like nobody would give you money to do that then why now he having success at paypal obviously had a uh, he had a leg up on other people but along with that people are very focused on that. they're very focused on that and very forgiving right so I think that's kind of the the you know I mean Bowie so so for those who don't know the line like Bowie and I uh, worked at United Health Group together we like sat a couple of, you know sat a little ways away and uh, part of that organization they simply can't right? not because of who they are but because the industry itself is so heavily regulated that this would never be. yeah it's it's funny you say yes yes healthcare is very heavily regulated very slow. So much so that even I think JP Morgan and what was it, Amazon, JP Morgan, I forget what it was, but they tried to disrupt the market and they even quit <laughs> for so, healthcare. So speaking so to like, oh, work. Oops, sorry. So speaking to Bowie's question, one of the, the rules of thumb I like to use, I picked up when I worked for a company named Persistent. They talked about um, when a company was born and how that affects the culture. There's companies that are born before the internet. And so government, um, finance, uh, automotive, <clears throat> born before the internet, one type of culture. Hard to bring Agile in there. Cisco is kind of on the cusp and working in Silicon Valley, you go around Cisco and Cisco has an awful hard time with Agile in many instances. Okay, then there's companies that are born in the internet. They have an easier time. Okay, and uh, there's still some problems with companies that are born in that phase. Then there's companies that are born in the cloud. Uh, and those companies, Agile is almost native. So Bowie, um, there's awful big opportunities in those, call them smokestack industries, um, ones that were born before the internet because they're in an adapt or die situation. So it's just gotta be a, a question of your tolerance for pain in my opinion. Well, and I think there's, I don't know if it necessarily has to be a pick the either or, right? Uh, you know, obviously in the large scale scrum um, guidance, we talk a lot about things like parallel organizations. And, you know, I, I think there's an opportunity to say, um, there's, there's a set of experiments we can run here. And if we can, if we can build the muscle of truly doing business experiments, right? And think about that and, and propose it as, really like we're framing it up as a scientific experiment. And, you know, we have some evidence, we have some data, you know, that, that, that's supported by, you know, financials in the market, et cetera. So it's not just making stuff up, right? What is the experiment then that we could run in our current organization that, that provides data and metrics and some sort of, a, you know, a rational approach to this stuff. So I don't think it necessarily needs to be pick one or the other. I think it's, is there a way that we can influence um, through the empirical process um, in a way that, that creates an argument or creates a case that, that we can't gave, we can't obviously create that case by just pointing to the scrum guide over and over and saying, it says here, it says here, like it's gotta be something else other than that. So, so th this is kind of the stuff that I was thinking about when I was listening to the conversation is well, these, are, these are experiments that we could run without having to completely depart from what we're doing right now or where we're trying to coach, right? It seems like that's the hardest thing for me too, um, is convincing senior leadership or just anyone for that matter, right? Even when you talk to your friend and, and you're like, hey, um, you should probably start caring about your finances or you should start, you know, stop smoking so much, right? It's like, there's that sense of urgency. It's like, they know it's wrong, right? I know that I need to, uh, let's say, save a certain amount to retire, but am I going to do it? I know I need to eat healthy. Am I going to do it? Where's that sense of urgency? Right. So even if we know, right, that it's good for them, um, it's good for the company, unless they, it's almost like you don't see it until it's too late. Right. 
Um, you could talk about civilizations making the same mistake. You could really go broad with that. But even in our own personal lives, we make the same mistakes a lot. So how do we, what sense of urgency do we have? Um, or if we can't find a good sense of urgency for them, aside from, hey, you're going to watch out, you're going to be disrupted soon if you don't do it. That's not enough, right? Um, it, it, for most companies, it's not, unfortunately. So that's that's where I have a tough time. Like, how, how do I convince these people, right? It's almost like um, the person themselves needs needs to understand the, the importance of personal development and, and enlightening them so they can see it for themselves and hopefully them have the courage to, to tell others and spread the word, right? Influencing others is hard and actually agile professionals have a lot to influence others. I mean, it is pretty much all about influencing uh, what we do. <laughs> so. Yeah, we, we need to excel at that. I keep finding myself coming back to uh, how does one change financial models? How does one change uh, company ownership in some way to sufficiently empower uh, people? Um, but I haven't, I don't have my finger on it. I think he tried to give us the answer with uh, the efficiency and cost of delay, but both of those are based on value. And I've had really bad luck trying to measure value. You were talking about the sense of urgency before, and on the flip side, he's talking about a, a sense of, that sometimes the sense of urgency is what can drive a business into the ground. If people who are at the top if their incentive is just, you know, we, we want to see some money, uh, you know, within the next couple of years, and you're saying, no, you know, like, that's not actually a really good idea. We're, we're thinking long term, we need to reinvest this into the business and all this. And, and he's talking about this. I didn't, I didn't know that Elon Musk um, slept in a sleeping bag and, you know, on the floor and, I mean, that's very unusual and, and probably not something that I'd even recommend, you know, as, as like a way of being um, for business. But at the same time, having someone who is that invested in their own business and over a, with a very long term vision is an extremely powerful thing. And it's like, so uh, how do you replicate that? You, you can't. You, you, you can find videos where Elon Musk talking about sleeping in a sleeping bag. And he, what he's saying, uh, and from Joe Justice Workshop, he also saying Elon Musk sleeps on the bottleneck. Not everywhere. He doesn't go and think like, oh, well, should I sleep in this room or that room? No, he sleeps where the problem is. On Earth. <laughs> So do you but, think but James, I think I think you hit the nail on the head. It's the change of the financial mm -hmm. ownership model or the ownership of monetary authority or whatever you want to call it. Because in all the big publicly listed companies, especially in regulated industries like healthcare services and financial, the CFO and his or her directs control the dispensation of money, right? The OPEX and CAPEX. And the CFO is more powerful than the CIO, the CTO, the chief product product officer, the marketing officer, everybody else. And the CEO looks to the CFO to control the finances. And as, as Joe indicated, they're all accountable to the board and their incentives are based on that and their back, you know, their compensation. So unless you change the uh, corporate, um, like the C-level design, as he was talking about, uh, and I think some of us have worked in environments where they've tried the so-called agile funding, they're like the fixed headcount team and just run, but you still have to ask for the money up front. You still spend nine months or whatever making the business case to get the money to do the first uh, increment or whatever it is. The partial, like partial solutions are um, uh, just profit sharing. Another partial solution is uh, an ESOP that owns a portion, but that doesn't really change control. Um, another, uh, sorry, Lulu is talking. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, Lulu, you're paying the butt. Uh, but I think it's also interesting that with a publicly held company, 
where all of us tend to own a tiny amount of the shares of different companies in our in our stock portfolios or in our 401k or index funds, et cetera. Um, you and I know that it makes no sense for us to go vote on board elections for public companies, right? Our voice is insignificant. And the truth is that nobody really controls other than maybe a few, uh, you know, maybe Warren Buffett who has a big share in the in the company or whatever, or a, a large hedge fund manager may have an impact. Um, so it seems that companies are really run by the management layers um, and that it, they're even kind of self, you know, it's this ancestral thing where they decide who's on the board and, and the board doesn't really have accountability to everyone. And so the people at the top have an incentive to simply maintain the status quo, make money for themselves, not have anything drastic happen. And the real owners of the company, at least on paper, the, the owners on paper don't effectively have any control. The people that have control is this management class. Um, I don't know what one does about that. I just think it's useful to uh, a tightly held company and the board members on a tightly held company is a radically different thing than the board members on a public company where there well, is no real accountability. And, it's all. And I think there, there is such a thing as saying, you know, even if we can't affect a global change in a, a large organization, we can act as if and show what this would be like, right? So there, it is possible to translate that to an experiment as well. Even if you can't influence the entire financial structure, you can still show here's how this would operate, right? Um, Russ, I think you, were you trying to jump in earlier? I, we had a few people. Then yeah, I don't, I don't know if you can hear me or not. I, I was just going to ask the question, how much, of, how much do you think motivation falls into this? Because the motivation structure at Tesla seems to be different than the motivation at, at other companies in the sense of they don't really get paid a salary. So what is their motivation? Their motivation is to make that next objective work because the more they make it work, the more money they earn in the sense of stock. And so I think that plays a lot of in, in, in how Tesla is different from, from the other traditional structures in, in, in corporate world. I think in order to maintain an agile structure, in, in order for a successful agile transformation not to get blown up, our goals can be much more limited. Our goal is simply, how do you incentivize the you know VP of engineering, SVP, whatever you know the head of uh, let's call it the uh, general manager of that division. How do you get them incentivized such that when there's a change, it won't naturally all blow up? But you don't even have to fix the whole world. You just have to fix that. I think there's a couple of things, and I know Joel has been raising his hand. Joel Robinson, you've been raising your hand for a few minutes. I'd like to circle back to, you know, we're all, most of us on this call are probably really interested in, in bringing agility to wherever we're at. And we can call it transformation, modernization, we can call it whatever we want. So there is some intrinsic value that has us in that place. And it might be because we really want, we really believe that we can make life better for the users of our products, life better for the employees at the company. You know, we can, we can really make a difference here. And so we're gonna go hit the grind every day, really trying to, to make it better. Always knowing we're never gonna be Tesla. We're never gonna be these other companies, but there is something that we can do that's gonna make the lives so much better for our, our clients, our customers, and our users and, and our team members. And I think that's the intrinsic value we just never let go of. Otherwise we would be quitting these jobs looking for new ones. So I'd like to keep, just remind us of, you know, that's why we don't quit is because that's sitting there. And we all do recognize that the incentive system absolutely gets in the way of comprehensive and holistic uh, transformation. We know that. So we're just out there trying to get as far as we can uh, within that space. And if we can't convince the sense of urgency at the top of an organization, then you know you in, going into it, it's only gonna go so far. And if you're a multinational, you're gonna, you're gonna have a, 
a company within a company within a company within a company. You have a CIO who's reporting to a CIO who's reporting to a CIO who's reporting to a CIO. Okay, come on, you're only gonna go so far, right? But that's why we show up is because we have a vision and we believe we can get it so, we can participate in helping it get so far and that's great. And that impacts the lives of the people working there. And I think that's a great return on our own investment. And Joel, I know you've been raising your hand, so uh, maybe we can go to you now. All right, I'm gonna put that hand down so it doesn't linger any longer. Uh, so my thought was, I, I see an opportunity to use uh, the cost of delay. And I would, as I, I recommended this website called Black Swan Farming that I learned uh, quite a bit about cost of delay years ago. Um, from a lot more helpful to me than the Don Reinertsen book on the subject, which I have also read, but pragmatic, putting it into use, I think that website has some pretty good guidance. And to tie it together with the causal loop diagrams to show when you have budgeting working this way, this is the system you're creating. And when you change the, those dynamics, you'd get a different outcome. Um, and I think that if you went to a leadership team and said, you know, let's understand how we do budgeting here and let's look at, you know, how that intersects with the, how it delays getting things done, delays value realization or delivery. Um, I think it could be very eye-opening to see, oh, so our policies for holding the tight, put, you know, purse strings are causing, we're saving, we're saving dimes and pennies when we, when it's costing us you know, millions maybe to be so slow and frugal around those things. I think these companies that have policies about how to enable, you know, everybody in the organization to spend money more freely, they recognize that they aren't going to be able to effectively save those nickels and dimes, um, but they can affect how to not, you know, piss away millions because they're slowing their whole company down. So, I mean, there's been lots and lots of stories about empowering empowering your your workforce to spend money more than you might feel comfortable with is actually a way to really improve a lot of things including you know custom, how your customers view the company like the zappos case of solve a problem by spending money you have a you know certain budget you can spend to make a customer happy those kinds of ideas if you modeled that the cost you know you're immediately solving a problem rather than letting it linger there's a lot of value in that. And I think that the, the less approach of doing a diagram combined with the, you know, Don Reinertsen approach of cost of delay uh, could really open eyes. I guess I'm repeating myself now. And, and I, would, I wanted to add, if you read um, Joe's book, mm. there are some crazy ideas there like, the team gets the budget and then split it between the team members and they decide how they split money. Like, <laughs> where have you seen that? <laughs> so, Right. And if you could, if you could do, because I think the immediate reaction is the freak out of, well, what if they spend it poorly? Well, model that. How, how much are you saving money and, and reducing risk to do it one way versus you know, throttling your company by being safe? And there I said safe, but <laughs> that's <laughs> a naughty also, word here. That was subtle, man. Really subtle. Even has got his hand up. I know. Well, it's, well it, it's that, but the, by the way, Joel, it's an interesting thing. So I mentioned it earlier, but in the chat, Harley Davidson back in the 90s used to give line workers $100,000 spending authority. And you could go out and buy a machine if you needed it. Um, and, but of course, you know, like <laughs> as Joe said, you know, if you drive a forklift into the side of a truck because it's funny. Um, you're getting fired, right? So they, you know, it was it was that it was true empowerment. It's actually back to that kind of '80s concept of empowerment. Where do we where do we empower, and to what degree, and what are the boundary conditions of that? And I think it's based on the the, the company you're in and the industry you're in, right? How much do you need that, and where do you need it? It's probably the closest thing to whatever your customer, to the product you're selling to the customer, is where you would need that um, where you would need that sense of autonomy. Because you don't need that sense of autonomy and finance. You need to close the books every 30 days. Jubin, did you have something to add? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I was just going to say these changes, the wide ranging changes, obviously take a lot of time. It's just with perseverance and convincing that we have to drive the change, reasoning why 
there is value in doing things in a certain way. Obviously, not all of them, all of those will be taken in. It's a lot of perseverance which is required. I've seen it go both ways because they keep following the hierarchy. They keep following, hey, I have to still follow up. It just doesn't work. Unless there is a lot of conviction to say drive it really hard, that's the way only the results will come. And most of the organizations that I worked with or my clients, they're all like slow driven and hence it takes a lot of time to get the results out or make the changes that really get the results. So it's a long way to go, frankly. But keep trying, I would say. Yeah, I, I totally agreed with, with that comment and also with Joe uh, Justice's earlier comments and observations that it's what keeps us from being more agile is the structure of the company. And as you as you start to take those barriers out of the way, your teams can naturally go faster. So when I'm a scrum master and when my teams tell me, well, we could never do that in X amount of time. I'm, okay, what's, what's standing in your way? Let's go talk with that team. And I realized, because I also work at a very large public company, <laughs> and there's just some things you can't change. So sometimes it's just, well, who are you connected with within your own line of business? So I've been uh, very fortunate that I'm in one of the more forward-thinking lines of business as far as Agile goes right now. Um, and it, and I, I've kind of stayed put because I'm comfortable there. And I know if I go into another line of business, it's going to be like having to re-up that Agile game again. And really get them moving, but I would I would encourage you to make make the best uh, best of it, even with your own line of business. If you can't change the whole company, once they start seeing that your line of business is doing something, and they looked at ours, they said we want to replicate what you're doing in other lines of business because we're seeing how well Agile is working uh, in your particular line of business. But we were doing this for several years before anybody paid attention to it, and it, it can be a long game. I talked to some people in some companies that took them you know, a better part of a decade to really go agile because it just took those different lines of business um, catching on and, and, and catching up to what they were doing. So don't, don't give up hope, don't give up the ship, but, but continue to work within your line of business even if you can't change the whole company yet. You'll get there. Narrow Thank and deep. Scott. Craig, Craig yeah. talks, uh, Craig Larman talks about narrow and deep um, adoptions of, of less, right? And in focusing on, on the structure and, and, uh, that you know, culture follows structure, um, generally speaking, um, and and that makes a lot of sense to me. To you know, work work with uh, one business unit at a time and improving their relationship with you know their the, the development teams and the DevOps culture and all that good stuff. And um, yeah, I, I, I it, it, I've thought about this question a lot in my career too. Like, mm, should I quit this company? I'm not sure if this company is able to transform, but if there's some glimmer, glimmer of hope, like within like the local you know product group that I work on, and there's people that are willing to change, and I can talk to people in senior positions and you know reason with some of these people, then I'm going to stick around. But then you know Craig will also say, if you can't change your organization, change your organization. <laughs> I like that one too. Yeah, that's good advice. <laughs> He also says that everything falls apart like every seven or eight years, or I forget what year number it is, but seven. It's seven. a magic number. <laughs> all, all less ad adoptions fail within seven years. Or well, that's interesting that uh, Elon Musk's organizations are sustainable. And uh, it's great that we, we can see an example. Uh, even though, we, as, uh, as Jerry said, maybe we cannot reach as far. Um, but having that example lurking on the horizon is very, uh, you know, supportive. Uh, it's great to know that there are uh, companies like that. I, I personally was fascinated by a, a, a small group in Optum called Cirrus, uh, relatively small, uh, was organized way better than I have ever seen anywhere. Uh, with, with all this, you know, automated testing and DevOps and and stuff, it was a great to example, uh, to have, uh, you know, forever uh, for me, uh, wherever I go, I, I can measure against that. Uh, that. That was awesome. And many people will agree with me here because we are all optimal alumni here in a way. <laughs> I think there's a Tony that wants to say something. Yeah, hi guys, can you hear me? Hey, Tony. Yeah, hi. Yeah. Um, the thing that, 
nobody's really talked about here is that all of the employees at Tesla have a digital feedback. When they make a change in something, they see whether it's going to improve or not the outcome. In software, that's actually quite hard to do. So if you spend some money, you don't necessarily know straight away whether that's had a, uh, an efficiency effect. Whereas with hardware, you can do that. If you didn't have that, these guys cannot self-manage. It's not possible. In software, we can do that too, using automation. I'm curious to understand. Well, if, if something hasn't been written, then it's hard to do that. But maybe the overall value of the software well, yeah. we, can, we can argue about this because you can say, well, how do we know that the part is improved if nobody's driven this car yet, right? Yes, but this, no, 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 it doesn't work like that with Tesla. Tesla is self-testing everything. If you've looked at Joe Justice's cell scheme, you'll see you've got um, the ready side. I, I forget the name of it, the, the incoming check and the outgoing check. Definition of ready, definition of done. This is how correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That has to have improved, or at least you know what you did was not as good. Do they as know how much be. money that's worth, Tony? Is there some sort of how do they map that to finance? Well, they have the ability. They have an AI stack that's looking at every everything, so that somebody can see on the board whether their change has made a difference or not. Yeah, on some of the podcasts, Joe talks extensively about how AI is used in the um, Elon mm -hmm. Musk companies. A and there were questions like, well, what executives are doing in uh, in your company? And he's like, well, we don't need executives uh, in, in uh, SpaceX and, and Tesla because everything is, uh, you know, mostly everything is replaced by AI. And there's, mm -hmm. you know, a number of engineers who, who are, Kind of in evolving AI in organization. So that is uh, maybe another uh, factor of agility. If you think about what how technology helps agility, you will not be able to release every, every week if you don't have a DevOps stack. And you sure. will not be sure. able to do this three hour sprints uh, if you don't have AI stack, maybe. Mm -hmm. we, we maybe need to dig deeper into Joe's knowledge on this three hour, we didn't really get to that tonight, but it would be good because he knows more than most. Because I, I get the feeling that he has, he doesn't think agile is what Tesla does. Nothing that he knew before was similar to what was there, which is really interesting because he's been, you guys have been doing this a long time and yet Elon comes along and changes everything. I think it's, um, we hear about all, all this stuff, right? All these processes, we always say, hey, process is everything, but we think about it in some ways too. Process, agile, we use all this terminology and how it's good because it's something that we've learned, mm -hmm. right? So as much as we think that it's, you know, we're like, oh yeah, we need to change mindsets, even we're not fully changed in, some, in many of the senses, right? Sure. Um, and, and it's not like agile, the word, it's more, and then like sometimes we even say principles just for the principles of agile, not necessarily what they really, really mean, right? Mm -hmm. It's a way of being. It's like when you, I've watched a video probably a couple months ago on, I don't know if you've heard of Angela Duckworth, right? For grit, okay. right? Grit is is that um, basically making sure that no matter what your goal is, you're going to work in, and there's certain people that work on that day in and day out. They don't have to be the smartest person in the world. They don't have to be, you know, um, that person who has everything from the start, but um, the fact that they're constantly working towards that goal and they get motivation from it. Um, and there's certain ways that they think, I'm sure we can all think of someone that we're like, wow, how do, how do they do that? How do they stay motivated? How do they, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, they think a certain way, right? They have a certain mindset, a certain way of being that I don't know how many of us have fully embraced that yet. I don't think I have, yeah. no, right, I'm, personally. Yeah. Um, so, so yep. here's, the, here's the interesting challenge, right? When we think from like a perspective of giving, given a framework a way of doing things a certain way, we, we kind of go and keep using that. I'll just take an example of like a definition of ready. Like I was, I am working with a new team and this time I've decided, hey, I am going to do away with the definition of ready and see where it leads us. If there is no problem that the team faces, we just 
take that out of the perspective, right? So that's one experiment I've planned to do with a new team that I'm working on. So as we cut down all of these processes, we will be more efficient. What's the end objective? We are trying to work towards the goal of a sprint. If we achieve that without issues for a few times, then hey, that process is actually not required. So as we move along, like in these, these like steps and the frameworks, we're bound by those statutory or the implied steps that we need to do. But think along the along the way that at some point in time, once the team is mature, do we really need to kind of work with all of these constraints? It will mm -hmm. be an opportunity for constant improvement. Okay, but none of which, of course, Elon's teams do. They can work anywhere on the factory. They can just walk away and move across. This is something so different. It's I just definitely. wonder. I, I just wonder whether any current company can change to this. It may be the new startups that will get there if they have people similar to Elon. Yeah, I think it was in some way with warehouses, right? Where warehouses were traditionally um, a certain way and then Amazon flipped it on its head and then they found a way more efficient way to do that. Because at the end of the day, no matter like Scrum, Agile, whatever we're saying here, it's what what is it that you're trying to achieve? What problem are you solving? What's the fastest way you can keep solving? What's the fastest way you can innovate? And what's slowing it down? I know we talk about value streams and all that stuff, but um, what is it that's slowing it down? Why do you want it? What problem are you solving? What problem do you think you're solving? How are you going to know you're solving it? Right? It's like basic, it's basic stuff, but we wrap around all these like, oh, that's value stream mapping. Like as soon as I say something, someone ties a word to it. Oh, that's value stream mapping. They think in process, right? Oh, that's, you know, that's Scrum. That's Agile, right? But if we strip all that away and all this terminology, like fundamentally, if we think about what we believe, anything we do, if I wanted to start a business, I, we can think of examples that we hear all the time. Maybe Zappos, for example, a shoe company, right? An online shoe company. The guy used to prove the ideas by taking pictures of, um, of uh, shoes at the mall and see mm -hmm. if people have it, are interested in it. Kickstarter, right? People don't even have to spend money anymore. They just go and be like, hey, here's my idea, right? Let's see how many people are financially backing it before I even start the idea, sure. right? Okay. Um, so it's it's all this stuff and it's like it's just almost like it's just a way of thinking right um and and a lot of times we attach terminology to it because that's what we know and that's what we've been studying but it's it's just a way of thinking right and that's what i'm saying fundamentally it's a way of thinking and then if you keep all the terminology out as much as you can and focus on the fundamentals behind it mm -hmm. right it, it, it becomes in just the way you think regularly so yeah i, I want to back yeah, that's up. Oh, yeah let's Go take ahead. the example of amazon right they they had a very user centric approach for example if the buyer is not happy they had given the rights for that customer service representative yes trust the customer if they are saying they are not happy just make it easy for them to return the product return their money if they want to do it or return it to their account and make them happy, right? So if you look at the older interviews of uh, Jeff Bezos, he keeps saying that, hey, the customer mm -hmm. is at the center of everything that I do. The, the second example for Amazon even to compare, like Tesla obviously has done a lot, but Amazon itself has done a lot. They turned something really upside down, right? Say for example, it's just said, hey, if you are able to spend so much money, we will do give you free shipping. That itself kind of brought them more customers. So they kind of went on doing a few things at a time, constant improvement, right? So it's not that, hey, just Tesla has achieved great things. There are definitely certain other organizations which have done that. It's just the realization has to happen at the organization level that, hey, we really need to have a fundamental shift, do a lot of decentralization, give a lot of control down rather than keeping that control. Because as soon as the control keeps going up, the decisions are delayed, right? The which is really different. The rational thinking sometimes may not be happening. Anyway, just wanted to add, add these quick points here. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so maybe maybe one more comment, and then I would suggest if you enjoy conversations like these, you should join our next month uh, Twin Cities Less uh, Lean Coffee. Uh, we'll be meeting from five to seven. It's the second Tuesday of every month. Um, so again, it's 7 p.m. So we'll probably be wrapping up here. Did anyone want to have just one last comment? They're like, please, let me just say this. Go ahead. Yeah, I do. Yes, go I, ahead. I have had a hard time with Elon Musk's companies 
uh, as far as the employee burnout factor. When I was in uh, the Seattle area, I saw a guy wearing a SpaceX sweatshirt and I was there with my two kids and I, and I, hey, look at that SpaceX guy. And I said, would you recommend that company to a guy with two kids who he, who he enjoys spending time with? And the guy goes, <laughs> and I, and like that's all I needed to hear. As much yeah. as I love the, the direction that his companies have gone and I've invested in some of them, uh, I don't wanna work at a company that, that values sleeping in a sleeping bag at the bottleneck. I'm just not that hardcore. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, there, and, and, oh, go ahead, Vlad. Yeah. And, and other things uh, that Joe uh, talks about, like 12 hour shift, for example. It's not eight hour shift, but 12 hour shift. Uh, and also, he was mentioning, like, I didn't open Facebook or some other media stuff for months. Uh, because I, I was not interested uh, to do that. <laughs> the only thing I was use, using is the app for Tesla app on my phone. That's that's the only app I used for, for several months. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, um, we are at the end of the time. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. It was um, a really good meetup today. Uh, thanks, Vlad, for inviting uh, uh, Joe on. Uh, I do want to plug uh, Gene's event to Gene had a really good meetup yeah, uh, over the weekend. Uh, check out this link. Uh, it's it's about um, implementing less in in uh, scaling team or excuse me self designing team uh, in Miro. It's what it's it's mind blowing stuff. So take a look at that link um, if you if you're hungry for less in between uh, now and the next one. So check out New York City large scale Scrum, Twin City large scale Scrum. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Great to see everyone. Thanks for your perspective. Awesome conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Take care.